Okay, so we are going to get started. Um, firstly, thank you so much for joining us today um, for what will be a very informative presentation and discussion. My name is Stephanie Foner, and I work in the Office of Alumni Relations at Northeastern on our domestic engagement team, which means I bring events and programs to alumni around the country. Usually these happen in person, but recently they have been virtual. Um, and I am very glad to be with you all here today. So just a first, um, a couple of housekeeping items. Please keep your microphone on mute. You are free to leave your video on if you'd prefer. Um, but we just ask that the microphones remain on mute to have a good sound quality for all participants. If you have any questions over the course of the presentation, some clarifying questions, please feel free to utilize the chat box. Um, and then Professor Wilson will be speaking for about 20 minutes and there will be time for Q&A at the end. Um, so if, as I said, over the course of the presentation, you have any clarifying questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, but we will be having a larger Q&A experience at the end of the presentation. Um, and at that time, again, please use the chat box because um, it's just easier to have folks use the chat box and I will read the questions out loud. Um, and some of you may have some technical questions, um, but please use your best to use accessible wording as I and many of us on this presentation are not technical experts. Um, but I will do my best to relay the questions as best as possible. Um, so now I'm excited to introduce our presenter today, Professor Christo Wilson. There he is. <laughs> professor Wilson is an associate professor in the Corey College of Computer Sciences at Northeastern University. He is a founding member of the Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute at Northeastern and serves as the director of the BS in Cybersecurity program. Professor Wilson's research focuses on online security and privacy with a specific interest in algorithmic auditing. And now I'm happy to turn the floor over to Professor Wilson. Thank you, Stephanie, for that introduction. And thank you all for being here. Uh, it's nice to spend some time with you today. Um, so I'd like to spend a little time today talking to you about one of the main thrusts of my research, which is something that we call algorithm auditing. Um, so I want to sort of explain what that is, why I think it's really important, and how it applies to pressing issues of the current day, like misinformation, uh, and conspiracy theories around things like COVID-19. Uh, so as Stephanie said, you know, I'm Christo Wilson. You can call me Christo. Uh, I got my PhD in 2012. I'm uh, in the Corey College of Computer Sciences and I'm part of the Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute. Um, I'm just coming off a, a sabbatical actually. I was over at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard uh, serving as a fellow. Um, and I'm happy to be back at Northeastern, you know, starting again in the fall. So to set the stage a little bit, you know, I want to talk about the idea that algorithms and algorithmic systems are really ubiquitous today. They're all around you, whether you realize it or not. Um, so one area where you've encountered this for sure is search engines, right? You go to Google or to Bing to look for content on the web. And they're using very sophisticated algorithms to try and figure out what is the content that's right for you. You know, one of the most interesting things about these systems is that they tend to be personalized, right? So if you go and search for COVID-19 and I search for COVID-19, we don't necessarily get the same results, right? Google might look at uh, a variable like location, right? They'll say, Christo's in Massachusetts, so we're gonna show him results from a local hospital. You know, if you're in someplace else like California, right, they might show you different results from different local healthcare providers, right? So there's this algorithm that's changing the content based on your personal attributes, right? Another area uh, where this is really, really prominent is social media. You know, your Facebook newsfeed is heavily curated by algorithms. You know, Facebook is not like Twitter. It's not just a reverse chronological list of all the content from your friends, right? Facebook looks at all the things you've done on Facebook in the past and tries to figure out 
what content do they think you're going to like the best, right? Is it from a person who you're really close to? Is it from a, a particular news source that you prefer? You know, what's going to get you to click and engage? So it's heavily curated by these algorithms. Uh, E-commerce increasingly has these, these kinds of algorithmic elements. So if you're thinking about a place like Amazon, you know, anytime you look at a product, there's that box at the bottom that says recommended for you, right? It's trying to figure out these are other things that we think you'll enjoy and buy. Or we can talk about media platforms. You know, Netflix, their entire business model is based on algorithmic curation, right? Netflix has a huge library of content, like overwhelmingly large. And yet when you go on Netflix, the things that you like are right there, front and center, right? Because they're looking at what are the things that you've watched and enjoyed in the past, you know? So here's a new season of that show you like, or here's a, a new show or a new movie that's like the things you liked in the past, right? To try and encourage you to watch more stuff. So, you know, by and large, this kind of algorithmic curation of content, it, it's really everywhere. Um, again, whether you realize it or not, you know, you're using websites and apps that are collecting data about you and then using it to try and personalize your experience. And most of the time, this is fine. I mean, we love it when Netflix tells us about that perfect new show, right? It, it delights us. But the issue is that these kinds of systems can go wrong. So here's a, a famous example that you may have heard of. There was a study from a professor uh, named Latanya Sweeney about seven years ago where she looked at racial discrimination in ads on Google. So what she found was that if you went to Google and you searched for a white sounding name, like Chris Wilson, you tended to get ads that looked like this. And it says, looking for Chris Wilson, find them at the yellow pages, right? A very benign ad. But if you went and searched for a black sounding name, like Trayvon Jones, the majority of the time you would see ads that looked like this, right? Trayvon Jones, arrested? You know, check at instantcheckmate.com. So the ad is implying that Trayvon Jones, whoever that is, has a criminal record, you know, whether he actually has a criminal record or not. So you can imagine if you're an employer, right? You might Google someone's name to see what you know, kind of history is available about them. If the first thing you see is Trayvon Jones arrested, that might influence your decision to say, not hire this person or not rent them an apartment. You know, even though it may not be true, right? This person may not have an arrest record. So, you know, Latanya Sweetie systematically studied this and showed that it was happening for all kinds of different uh, African-American sounding names. And this is a really uh, interesting example of an unintended consequence of, of big data and machine learning. This is not happening because there was a racist engineer at Google, right, who coded the algorithm to do this. You know, instead, Google's targeting ads based on data, right? So they look at in the past, what ads have people clicked on, right? And people have these kinds of biases. So the, in the data, it looked like when people search for certain kinds of names, they tend to click on these background check ads. And so then the algorithm starts reflecting that, right? In the future, when it sees names like that again, right, it sends these ads and creates this kind of racial bias. Now here's another interesting example from uh, just yesterday. So this was an article in the markup about a fake news headline and kind of the genesis of it. Where did it come from? So this woman is uh, Joe Ray Perkins. She's a Senate candidate from Oregon. Uh, and she went on kind of a Facebook rant, this conspiracy laden thing about how uh, George Soros and Obama were funding uh, Antifa. So she goes on this rant, and then this blog called Wonket, uh, which is a satire blog, wrote this article about her. You know, Oregon GOP senator warns about Antifa super soldiers. So this is satire. This is not meant to be real news. So what happened next? Well, a news aggregation app called Smart News scraped this article, right? So they took the headline and they changed it. So now the, the headline, the new headline reads, Grant County News, an Oregon GOP Senator warns about Antifa super soldiers. So it looks like a local, it looks like a local news headline now. And then they took that new headline and they advertised it on Facebook. 
So they targeted this to people all over Oregon. So they've gone from you know, a, a, a rant to a satire article to what now looks like local news being advertised all over Oregon. And then Facebook changed things even further. So Smart News said, we want to advertise this in Oregon. Facebook modified the targeting to only show it to senior citizens in Oregon. Right? Facebook's algorithm thought this kind of a headline is best for, for seniors. So you can see kind of the, the complicated interaction between all these different algorithms. You, know, you went from satire to an out of context news headline to then you know, hyper-local targeting to very specific people by two different algorithms. You know, so all of a sudden, something that was totally benign is now fake news being spread all over Facebook. So this really sort of highlights the, the difficulty and the challenges with having all this kind of algorithmic curation online, on, you know, on the web and in apps, right? Unintended consequences, data that's being misused, you know, interactions between different systems, it results in situations that are not good for a variety of reasons. So you may be concerned about this. You, know, you have, may have seen news articles about biased AI or the spread of inf you know, misinformation. Um, you know, governments and regulators are concerned about this. Uh, and that's, that's good. So it, I think it's good that people are, the, uh, the level of consciousness around these issues is being raised. But this leads to complicated questions. You know, if we're concerned about these algorithms, what are we gonna do about it? Well, that's hard. So we're talking about these systems from big tech companies and those algorithms are trade sec secrets typically, right? You can't see the code, you don't know how they work and they're constantly changing. So it's quite adversarial. Even if there was some kind of mandate that said all the source code has to be public, that still doesn't solve our problem. Right? Because the source code doesn't actually tell you enough about how these things are going to behave in the wild. To, to really understand the behavior in the wild, you'd also need the data underlying the system. And that data, you can't just put that data on the internet because it's highly privacy sensitive. So what are we going to do? You know, if we want to change tech companies' practices or even think about regulating these kinds of systems, how do you investigate them to figure out what they're really doing? So that's sort of where my research comes in. Right? I consider myself to be an algorithm auditor. So what does that, that mean? Well, there's sort of three goals of my research. So one is really focused on data. Who is collecting data about us? How is that data being shared and linked to your individual identity? Right? There's this whole data ecosystem. And then the second part is, how is that data being used? So in this part, we actually go and try to reverse engineer the algorithms that are being used by tech companies, right? Search engines, online advertising, social media, uh, e-commerce marketplaces. How are their systems using data to kind of curate your experience? And are there problems like promoting misinformation or racial bias or anything like that? So then the last piece of this is really advocacy, right? I think that tech companies need to be more transparent about their practices and their systems so that they can be held accountable. So investigating them sort of moves the needle in that direction. You know, I think that we have to really sort of understand what's going on in the world if we're gonna ask for people to adopt better practices. Uh, and then there's also law and policy elements here. Um, so in my capacity as a private citizen, you know, I'm actually a plaintiff in a lawsuit against the federal government that's trying to legitimize this kind of research in the public interest. Um, so talking to lawyers, talking to policymakers about how we can better regulate tech is a big part of, of what I do. So how do we actually go about auditing an algorithm, right? It's, you're often, when you hear about uh, algorithms, they're often described as black boxes, right? You don't know what's going on inside. So how is it that, that me, an outsider, can probe someone's system to figure out what's going on? So to really understand this, we have to break the, the questions down a little bit, right? There's two things that I wanna know. You know. The first is, very broadly, to what extent is an algorithm shaping content on a platform? 
you know, be it Facebook or Amazon or Google, what is the algorithm kind of doing, broadly speaking? Then the second question is why? What is it about you or your data or your behavior that's causing the algorithm to behave a particular way? So to get at these two questions, we use two different kinds of methodologies. The first thing that we typically do is uncontrolled real world experiments. Right? So this is a fancy way of saying that we get real people to help us. We recruit real people to kind of donate their data. Um, or you can think about it as us looking over real people's shoulder as they interact with the system, right? So we'll observe people using Google search, or we'll observe people using Twitter. And then we try to figure out, you know, based on what all these people are seeing, how is the system curating content, right? Does everyone see the same stuff? Well, that would mean that there's not really any sort of curation going on. You know, the system is very simple. Or is it that everyone sees different stuff? You know, which would suggest that there's a high level of, of, of curation, you know, a lot of personalization. So this helps us get at that first question. You know, what's kind of the, the broad picture of this algorithm? The, but it doesn't help us answer the second question, the why. Right? The issue is that people are just a mess of confounding variables. If you go on Facebook and they're showing you a bunch of misinfo, what is it about you that caused that? It's almost impossible to say. Is it the things you've clicked on in the past? Is it the friends you have on Facebook? Is it your demographics? There's just too much to unpack. So to get at that second question, we go back with controlled experiments. So this is, you know, in the lab, we go and interact with the service in a really regimented, heavily controlled way. So for example, if I want to understand Facebook, you know, I would go and sign up for dozens or hundreds of Facebook accounts, and every single one of them would be different in exactly one way, right? There's a, man, a male account, a female account, an old account, a young account. Here's an account with lots of friends. Here's an account with very few friends. Here's an account that follows CNN. Here's an account that follows Fox News. And based on all these controlled accounts, we can try to tease out, you know, what is it about them very specifically that's causing the algorithm to behave in different ways? Now, you know, obviously there's limitations here as well. I can't possibly test all variables. There's just too many, but you can at least get a sense of kind of the broad strokes. These are very particular things that had a big impact on an algorithm's behavior. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about a, a current research project we have going on. Um, so this is really focused on misinformation and disinformation around COVID-19 and the 2020 US election. So we're looking very broadly at these issues. Um, so how is Google search, uh, you know, facilitating uh, misinformation and disinformation? YouTube, you know, it's been called a radicalization engine. Is that true? You know, to what extent is YouTube recommending misinformation and disinformation. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, you know, basically all the major online media platforms, we want to know, are they showing this kind of content? And if so, why? So to get at this, uh, we're uh, recruiting a panel of people to help us. And the panelists are all going to take a survey and install a browser extension. So the browser extension does two things. It lets us passively observe what the participants are doing. Right, so if they run a Google search, we get to see that. We know what you searched for, and we know what Google showed you in response. Or if you're browsing Facebook, you know, we're there looking over your shoulder. We see what you see. So that gets at this kind of broad-based uh, analysis. The extension also lets us conduct experiments in people's browser. Right? So we can run Google searches, or we can look at YouTube videos to see how the, the, the algorithm behaves in the much more controlled way. You know, so if we have a thousand participants, we can have all of their browsers search for a particular keyword on Google at a particular time. And we can see for all thousand people, you know, what did they get for that kind of con at that controlled circumstance? Um, so this is you know, just starting, we're just now recruiting people and this will be running through the end of the year. Um, and the pile of data we get is gonna, gonna be enormous. 
So I can give you a, a highlight of, of some of the kinds of things that we are gonna be looking at with this data. Um, so in this particular analysis, what we were interested in is the partisanship of information in Google search results. Um, so this kind of gets at this question of whether Google is biased. You know, does Google have a left or right leaning bias when they show you search results? So each row in this table is a different search that we ran, right? For Donald Trump or Mike Pence or Democrat or Republican. And then along the bottom, so the different columns are the different kinds of results that Google shows, right? So sometimes they show a knowledge box, right? Where they try to answer your question. Um, sometimes they show news articles, right? So they have like a top news carousel. Um, sometimes they show things from Twitter. Sometimes they show videos. So if we just focus on this uh, bottom left-hand square here, right? That's a case where we searched for Putin so Vladimir Putin, and we're looking at the knowledge box, right? So they have a little card that's like all about Vladimir Putin, and the box is slightly blue, which means that, that we graded that information as left-leaning, slightly left-leaning, right? If the box was white, it would be completely neutral information, and if it was red, it would be slightly right-leaning information. So what this chart helps us unpack is how much does what you search for matter versus how much does Google's kind of algorithm matter? So if you look at different rows, right, that's, ask, that's sort of getting at this question of how much your behavior, the thing you search for matters. So I'm highlighting a couple of rows here. You know, if you look at cases where someone searched for the term Democrat or searched for the term uh, independent, you know, going across the, the columns, you see that most of them are either white or kind of slightly blue. And that sort of makes sense, right? If you search for the word Democrat, you'd expect the results to be slightly left-leaning. You know, contrast that to a case where you search for the term conservative. Now going across the columns, the boxes are bright red, right? And again, that sort of makes sense. You search for the term conservative, you'd kind of expect that the results you get would lean to the right, right? So this, again, gets at you know, the, the, uh, the question of, ind of, of you know, independent choice. You, know, you as a person searching on Google, that has an effect on kind of the partisanship of the information you receive. But now let's focus on some of the columns. So these two columns on the left are both news results, right? So this is a case where you search for, you know, let's say Donald Trump, and you get that box of like top stories about Donald Trump. Looking at all the columns, uh, looking at these two columns across the rows, most of them are slightly blue, which means that kind of regardless of what you search for, the news results on Google tend to be a little bit left-leaning. And the reason for that is they tend to highlight stories from CNN and the New York Times, right, which are slightly left-leaning news organizations. You know, there's definitely stuff from Fox News in there, but it's not the majority. Now contrast that to this column on the right that I'm highlighting, which is video results. Almost all of the video that is promoted on Google search is from YouTube. And you see that that column is almost always red, right? So regardless of what you search for, Google shows you video and it tends to be right leaning. You know, that's really interesting, right? Because if you think about YouTube, they have a gazillion videos and there's definitely ones that are left leaning and there's definitely ones that are right leaning. But those left-leaning videos just are not being highlighted by Google's algorithms. Right? Google tends to prefer these right-leaning videos. You know, so that's not a, a you issue. That's a Google's algorithm issue, right? And that's interesting to know. And that's something that, I mean, maybe you should be, we should push back against that. Or maybe we think that's fine. So here's another uh, interesting thing that we looked at. So this is looking at exposure to misinformation, so fake news, versus trust in political institutions, right? So the executive branch, uh, Congress, uh, and the Supreme Court. So you know, what we did here is we are looking at our participants and their news consumption. So in, and we're trying to figure out, did they ever read any articles that were fake news? And then we're comparing that to survey results, right? So did that person say that they trusted the executive branch? They said they trusted Congress. There's two lines here. So one line is people who never saw any fake news. That's the gray line. And the red line is, the ex is exposed. So these are people who uh, uh, read some fake news articles. 
the y-axis of the graph is trust. So how much do you trust uh, you know, your, your political institutions? And the, the y-axis across, or the x-axis across the bottom is political ideology. So going from very liberal to moderate to very conservative. So let's just focus on the gray line for a moment. This is people who did not encounter any fake news. What this is saying is that for people who are very liberal and did not see any fake news, they tended to have greater trust in political institutions than people who were very conservative. And that kind of makes sense. If, you know, painting with a very broad brush, if we're talking about left-leaning individuals, they tend to see you know, the federal government as, a, as an institution that we need uh, to promote things like you know, equality. Um, you know, versus say someone who's very conservative, they tend to see federal government as the problem, right? Small government is better. So they tend to have less trust in the federal government. You know, this is kind of a very classic story. But now let's look at the red line. So this is people who were exposed to fake news articles. Right? Now the relationship flips. All of a sudden, you know, very liberal people who saw fake news tended to have less trust in government than very conservative people who saw fake news. They tended to have more trust in government. And this is very interesting. You know, if we actually dig into the fake news that these participants saw, it tended to be right-leaning, right? So it was very uh, positive about the Trump administration, very positive about Congress, which at the time was controlled by Republicans. Um, so essentially it was right-leaning propaganda you start to see the effect of this, right? If you're very conservative and you're seeing right-leaning propaganda, it tends to make you trust the government more. Versus say, someone who's very liberal, you see right-leaning propaganda and has the opposite effect, right? All of a sudden it erodes your trust in government. So if you look at the political science literature, predominantly it tends to say that fake news decreases trust in institutions, right? It just makes everyone not trust the government. But when you really get quality data, you see that the story is a lot more complicated. You know, it's not just about eroding trust in general, it's actually about shifting trust between institutions and sort of controlling narratives. You know, so this is the kind of thing where you really have to have this broad data, you have to be in people's browsers, you know, seeing what they're seeing, looking at what algorithms are curating to really unpack all these different things. You know, what, to what extent is, are your decisions shaping your content, shaping your beliefs, versus to what extent are algorithms deciding what you see and influencing your beliefs? So I'll stop there. I'm you know, really interested to hear your questions, uh, and I'm happy to chat. Great. Thank you so much. Um, lots of food for thought. Um, so the Chat box is open for any questions um, or thoughts or any points that you would like to be elaborated on. Um, please go ahead and put them in the chat box and I will read them out loud. Um, okay, so the first question we have is, are there certain kinds of content that seem best suited to advocate for legally making it exempt from using an algorithmic content curation? So, it, I mean, it, in terms of like the academic literature and, and advocacy work, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of people who advocate for making some kinds of content not curated. Um, you know, you talk to like political scientists, they're very concerned about you know, political news being filtered by algorithms. Um, there's this concept of something called a filter bubble. So, you know, let's say that the algorithm learns that you are liberal and it decides it's only gonna show you liberal stuff in the future, arguably that you know, breaks down democratic discourse, right? I'm just inundated with stuff that confirms my biases and it becomes harder and harder for me to reach across the aisle and, and have a conversation with someone of a different you know, political ideology. Um, you know, so there, there's plenty of advocacy around that, that we just shouldn't have algorithms involved in those decisions. Um, on the other hand, there's people who claim the opposite. Uh, if I can have an algorithm that creates a filter bubble, I can have an algorithm that breaks the filter bubble down. Right? The al algorithm can learn, hey, this guy's super liberal. He needs a more balanced information diet. 
So we're going to show him things that are you know, not in line with his beliefs to try to expand you know, his views and challenge him. Um, and there's an argument to be made for that too. Um, this, you know, immediately gets into free speech issues. We're talking about private platforms. Um, do we want, you know, the government to decide when algorithms can and can't be used and how they're used and how content should be moderated? You know, maybe we think that's what we need right now because, you know, Facebook's out of control. Or you can take another, you know, view on that and say, absolutely not. I mean, we, we don't want a Chinese style great firewall around information, um, you know, pri private platforms are private and they should be able to make their own decisions. Um, I mean, so there's, there's voices on all sides of these issues. Um, you know, as far as my research is concerned, I'm really just trying to increase, increase transparency here. You know, to, to have those discussions in a meaningful way, I think we really need to understand what's going on because the tech platforms aren't gonna tell us. Um, and so that's really my role. Any other questions? Are people just, okay, great. Um, what are your thoughts on addressing the implicit biases in the algorithms? Yeah, so this is a, a really active area of research. You know, how do you de-bias an algorithm? Um, you know, there, there are some cases where it feels a little bit more straightforward. Um, and all those cases, it's, these are all cases where you have a really high quality data. Um, you know, so let's say that you want an algorithm that promotes news and you want it to be nonpartisan. You can do that, assuming that you can measure partisanship in the first place. Um, you know, so the, the, like, the results I showed you when we were looking at partisanship on Google, um, we measured partisanship actually based on Twitter. So we looked at uh, Democrats and Republicans on Twitter, what are the links they share? And if we see something like MSNBC and it's only shared by left-leaning people, we would say that's left-leaning content um, versus say, you know, Breitbart, if it's only shared by right-leaning people, we would say that's right-leaning content. If we agree that that's a, a reasonable baseline measure of partisanship, now we can control that in the algorithm, right? That just requires kind of the will to measure it, quantify it, and then modify the system to take that into account. Um, you know, there's other cases where this is a lot harder. Um, so like, for example, there's a lot of work on predictive policing, you know, uh, trying to predict where crime will happen and send the police there. You know, to do that, you need crime data. And as we're seeing now, you know, that crime data is itself heavily biased. Um, you know, you have police officers who tend to hang out in uh, disadvantaged areas, you know, uh, majority minority areas, that's where arrests happen. So that's where the data says crime is, is prevalent. You put that into an algorithm. And of course, that's where it sends the police. It's really hard to de-bias that because you don't have an alternative baseline. You know, all you have is this existing data. Um, you know, so if, I guess I would say the the tools are there. You know, if you're a company or a platform and you want to do better, the, the machinery exists, but you have to have that, the will to do it and you have to have the right kind of data. Um, and that, that can be hard. Okay. In terms of controlled research, is there a risk that companies start to pick up on those efforts and start creating algorithms to combat your attempts to peek into what they're doing. So changing, mm -hmm. um, so purging dummy accounts, things like that. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. You know, so we, we tread very carefully, both because we don't want to be noticed um, and have that affect our results. And we want to make sure that, that the data we're getting is, is actually representative. Um, but, we, you know, we also don't want to trigger security systems. You know, if I go and make a million fake accounts on Facebook, you know, that, that's, that's an attack on Facebook, right? That's the same thing that a purveyor of misinformation wants to do. They're gonna go make a million fake accounts and then use it to upvote their content so that everyone sees it. And you know, we don't, we don't wanna do that either. We don't wanna harm the platforms that we study. Um, so we, you know, we have to very carefully sort of walk this line. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, we never really know for sure if the data we're getting is really representative. Um, 
you know, did we get caught and they're subtly changing what we're seeing because uh, they know we're researchers? It's really hard to say. You know, we can compare that to the data we get from real people and sort of eyeball it. You know, is it reasonable? But will we ever have certainty? It's hard to say. Um, this also gets into terms of service issues. You know, we're doing these controlled tests with fake accounts. We're providing false information. Uh, terms of service on sites typically forbid this. So, you know, we're in violation. Uh, and that gets into really complicated legal questions, which is part of the reason I'm part of this lawsuit. Um, you know, are, are we criminal hackers when we investigate a platform? The law is unclear. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit more about the lawsuit? Yeah, so the, the law in question is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. This is the primary anti-hacking law in this country. It was passed back in the 80s. Um, the, the story is that, the, that uh, Congress passed this in response to the movie War Games. So if you've seen you know, that Matthew Broderick movie about nuclear war and hacking, Congress was very, very scared and they passed this anti-hacking law. Um, so you know, unfortunately, that law is very vague. It says you know, you're not allowed to have unauthorized access, but it doesn't define what is authorized and what is not authorized. Uh, so some circuits in, the, in this country, you know, the courts have said a terms of service violation is an access violation. So if you break the terms of service, you're in violation of this federal anti-hacking statute, right? So that would, under that interpretation, my research could be illegal, right? I could be a federal criminal as well as liable for, you know, civil penalties. Um, other courts disagree. Other courts say that that's not a reasonable interpretation. Um, you know, this is a, a, an anti-hacking law. If you're just making an account and it's benign, you know, you're, you're crawling public data that's not hacking into you know, a service in a, in a meaningful way. Um, so to try and get clarity around this issue, you know, we preemptively sued the Justice Department. Um, so I'm being rep represented by the ACLU. Um, you know, this, is the, this is how you bring clarity to these kinds of constitutional law questions. Um, so we, we had a, a very positive ruling. So the, this was in the, the, the district court in DC. Um, the judge basically said, um, if you're, uh, at, you know, accessing a website and it's public or, you know, all you're doing is making an account, those are not access violations. Uh, you know, terms of service does not determine what is and is not access. Um, so, you know, because the, the things we're doing in our research are not access violations, they don't actually fall under the law. And then the whole, our whole case was actually dismissed, right? Because if we don't fall under the law, then we have nothing to complain about. So it was sort of an interesting ruling. We got dismissed, but it was a victory. Um, so the, uh, there's another CFAA case that's now going up before the Supreme Court. Um, so this is still you know, actively being litigated. Uh, we just filed an, an, an amicus brief you know, in favor of the, the plaintiff in that case. Um, so you know, this is all ongoing. There's positive signs that this kind of work is legal, but that's not a certainty. Um. For those who participate in the study that you're working on, um, how will information and privacy be protected and stored? Is it through the university data center? Yep, so we're collecting really sensitive data. Um, so I, I'm the engineer behind all of this. So I can tell you um, when the data is collected in the browser, the first thing that happens is we strip identifiers so your username, your user ID, anything like that, that all gets removed before the data is transmitted to us. When it's transmitted to us, you know, that's encrypted. So it's all HTTPS. Uh, it's going to a server in my data center. Um, so only our IT staff has access. It's all key card controlled. Uh, the server itself is heavily firewalled. So it's you know, one way data coming in, uh, and then you have to have uh, a USB security token actually to log into that machine remotely. Um, and there's only two people who currently have access, me and the lead PhD student. Um, so that's you know where the raw data is going. That raw data will then be summarized and cleaned. Um, you know, so for example, people will do things like Google their own name. And since I don't know your name, I can't preemptively remove that from the data. 
you know, so things like people's names and addresses can still be in there. Uh, so all that data has to get summarized and cleaned and aggregated to a higher level before it's then moved to a separate machine for analysis. Um, so, you know, those analytical data sets, there shouldn't be any privacy issues uh, in those anymore once the cleaning is done. Do you have concerns about the use of algorithms to predict COVID-19 cases and or for tracking and tracing cases? Yeah, so this is a, a really you know, critical area right now. And yes, I, I have many concerns. Um, you know, so with respect to things like digital contact tracing, frankly, I think the, the whole idea is sort of bankrupt. Um, it presupposes that a large fraction of the population will install this app. Uh, and we, that, I mean, that's not a foregone conclusion at all. Um, the, the different apps that people are using for tracking are, are disparate, you know, different states have different ones, different companies, um, and there's no guarantee that they, they collaborate. There's also the issue of equity. You know, this is all predicated on you having a, a modern smartphone and many people don't have that, um, especially people who are disadvantaged. Even getting past those issues, you know, let's just say that digital contact tracing was ubiquitous. Uh, there's still a lot of issues there. You know, so this is a classic detection problem. Uh, you know, the contact tracing app says that you were nearby of someone who tested positive. Does that mean that you are now infected? Well, it really depends on the context and the context is missing. Was that person your hairdresser and they had their hands all over you? Then yeah, you're probably infected. Is this somebody, somebody you passed on the street when you were both wearing masks? Then no, you're not infected. Um, but all that nuance is gone. So we don't yet know what the false positive and negative rates are gonna be of these applications and if we can't bound to the error, then we really shouldn't be using it for public health because uh, I mean, it could go horribly wrong. Um, you know, with respect to privacy, Google and Apple have this framework that's actually quite privacy sensitive. Um, so I, I have less concerns there, uh, but not every app uses that framework. There's plenty that are just collecting all the data into a centralized place, typically controlled by a government. And I think we're right to be concerned that that's a slippery slope to more surveillance. Uh, and we, you know, you don't know how that kind of data will be used in the future because we don't really have proper laws about how that data is going to be gated and controlled. Um, so if we're going to do this, I feel like you really have to get the policy stuff right first. And, but unfortunately, that's not how things are unfolding. Let's take a trusting view of tech companies for a second and assume they want to make neutral algorithms. Mm -hmm. What are some basic steps to ensure that bias isn't introduced or is factored out in the code? Yep. Yeah, so I should be clear. I mean, we, we've done a lot of these investigations and never have we seen intentional malfeasance. You know, we, we've found stuff that is, is not great, but it's almost always some kind of emergent or unexpected property. Um, you know, so for, for a company that wants to head off those issues ahead of time, um, I think part of this starts before you even design the system uh, with, with kind of a value-centered design approach. Whatever you're building, you have to go talk to people. Um, and it can't just be, you know, the, the cross-section of, of engineers in the office, you know, who unfortunately are predominantly male, uh, uh, you know, wh white and, and Asian, you have to go out there and talk to people from different communities with different needs and try to figure out like, wh what are the worst case scenarios? What are the problem areas? Um, you have to try and, and go through this, this thought ex exercise of envisioning what, what's the place for this thing you're building in the world? Uh, what could go wrong? So, you know, once you have sort of mapped out this space of people's values, the things that could go wrong, then you can try to start operationalizing some of that. You know, how do you balance different values? Um, you know, that may be just, you know, straight design issues. Um, it may involve things like collecting data to train algorithms um, and keeping in mind, you know, 
how is this data being collected? What are the biases that are embedded in it? How do we get these biases out? Can we get these biases out? Um, and really, you know, embedding this kind of value reflection in every step along the way. Um, once you deploy, you have to keep monitoring, right? And the thing about technology is that it's both affected by society, but it also affects society. You know, as soon as you go live, you're now influencing the space. It's going to change, you know, you may change your assumptions. Um, so you have to be reevaluating all the time. Uh, and in my opinion, all of this really needs to be transparent. Um, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to dump your source code, but you need to demonstrate that you had a process. What, what were you thinking about? What were the issues you identified? What were the mitigations? Um, you know, so that, that people can look at this and, and critically think about it. Um, you know, if you've made assumptions that need to be revisited or, you know, there's, there's some group that's been marginalized unintentionally, you know, they, there needs to be a, a process by which they can understand what happened and contact you to, you know, help redesign this thing or, or, or make it better. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's this confluence of, of process and design, uh, you know, both inside and outside kind of the technology itself. Have any of the companies or platforms that you are researching been asked if they'd be willing to cooperate by allowing you to freely audit their algorithms? It seems like this should be rolled into corporate social responsibility advocacy. Yeah, so we, we always talk to the people we audit. Um, we, we, we don't want them to hear about this from the press. We want them to hear it from us. Um, the, we get a, we've had a wide range of responses. Um, some people are, are quite happy to talk to us. You know, we find problems and they're like, thank you for bringing this to our attention. Um, others are, are not happy, but they, they sort of grin and bear it. Uh, we, we've had a few cases where it was just openly antagonistic, you know, like threats. Um, and a lot of the time, actually the majority of the time, we just hear nothing. Uh, companies are, are really reluctant to engage with these issues. I suspect they see it as liability and they just don't want to know. Um, so we, we are actually cooperating with, with some companies. Um, you know, we have a, a relationship with people on Google's misinformation team. Uh, we're also doing an audit right now of a hiring company called Pymetrics. So this is a startup that does um, kind of algorithmic hiring. Um, and they claim that their, their algorithms are unbiased. Uh, and we're the ones who are, are now verifying that from the inside. So yeah, yeah, I mean, I think there is opportunity for collaboration. Um, I, I wish, you know, more companies saw this as part of corporate responsibility because there are people like me out there who, who want to do the work. Um, you know, this is still quite a fluid space. So what are the norms around these kinds of external audits? It's early days and it's hard to say. Um, you know, but we're, we're shaping those norms now. So there's a lot of opportunity and you know, I, I wish more companies would engage. Any other questions from folks? So I guess um, to end, what, at, what can we as consumers, as users be doing to prevent falling into these traps? Um, is there anything we as individuals can do in this space? Yeah, I think there's, there's quite a bit you can do. So the first step is, a, is just awareness. Um, you know, you'd be surprised uh, how many people are, you know, use Google and Facebook every day, but don't really realize the extent to which algorithms are shaping their experience. Um, there's been lots of surveys on this where, you know, people just don't understand that data is being collected about them you know, that it's being used to hyper target content. Um, so once you understand that, you know, that, that increases your digital literacy and you can sort of be a little bit more on guard and aware, you know, what just, wh why am I seeing this? Um, there are some active strategies you can take. Um, you know, so if you are shopping online or you're reading news and you're worried that you're being caught in a filter bubble, um, you know, switch to a different browser or go incognito, you know, that removes your cookies, makes you harder to track, at least temporarily. So you can sometimes get an alternate view into a system. 
Uh, switching between desktop and mobile often has the same kind of effect. Uh, or, you know, talk to your friends. Like if you're shopping for, um, you know, airlines and hotels, a lot of travel sites uh, do a lot of, of price discrimination and personalization. Um, so if you're concerned that you're, you're actually being given a raw deal, you know, call, call your mom, call your friend, have them do the same search and see if it's the same results uh, or if they're getting you know, better offers. Um, you know, so all, all that stuff is, is fine, you know, digital literacy and kind of actively uh, changing your persona to get a different view into a system, but it's also a lot of work. Like, do we want, is that how we want to live where all of our online interactions are like, we're second guessing them and it's really adversarial? Uh, and that's not the world I want to live in. Um, so the next step is, is advocacy. You know, if there's, uh, you know, congressional candidates or candidates, um, you know, for, for state level office who are engaged with these issues, vote for them. You know, where we may be on the cusp of, uh, you know, federal privacy legislation um, or uh, changes to uh, the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, which is the you know, platform immunity law. Uh, you know, how those laws change or the new laws that are written are gonna hugely impact this ecosystem. You know, are they allowed to just keep collecting data and doing things in a non-transparent way? Um, are we gonna, you know, have more power to see that data, to control that data? Is there gonna be liability? Um, you know, so the, the extent to which, you know, we can, we can advocate and vote and move that debate in, a, in the right direction maybe we can affect change that's that's really systematic in silicon valley great thank you um so thank you all so much for joining us um really just appreciate having you here um and i hope you have a wonderful rest of your thursday great weekend um and hope to see you at another virtual event soon